radio pinball, my husband is acting funny. When we think about the 1980s, a lot of pop culture comes to mind. But for forecasters, the 1980s was a period of some very notable cold outbreaks. Some of those are remembered even to this day. The one in 1982, another one in 83, 85, 89. Those were some pretty significant and severe cold outbreaks. And as we head into a new week, the weather charts are showing something similar coming up for much of February. And we're talking about outbreaks starting around the second week of February, probably extending into the third and fourth. Now, it's doubtful that we're going to see outbreaks as strong as those in the 1980s. The GFS probably overdoing even the one this weekend. However, we do expect it to be quite cold, and this will mark a significant transition in the weather pattern. Before we start looking at the forecast, we do want to get properly grounded into the current conditions. And we'll start out taking a look at the weather this afternoon. The weather this afternoon is dominated by this large high pressure area extending from the western Great Lakes down to Louisiana. This represents a mass of cold air that's gradually modifying and warming up. We can see the northern part of that air mass has temperatures in the low 20s, but down to the south it is a little bit more mild with temperatures near 40. We do have some rapid warming of the air mass in the Rockies in that region. You can see Denver already up to near 60 degrees and we do have a lee side trough starting to form from Montana down to Colorado. A plateau high covers the Four Corners area. Pretty mild there, lots of 40s and where we have the deeper valleys like Alamosa it's 29 but even for them that's pretty warm. Further out west we have a new Pacific system not quite as strong as the one we had last week, but it is a little bit further north and it's taken a track through the Great Basin area. I'm very barely seeing a closed low there, and if so, I would probably have to place it right in that region there. And then off the east coast, we have our departing weather system with a vast amount of cold air advection coming into the northeast U.S. and the mid-Atlantic region. Temperatures mostly in the 20s and 30s, and some snow coming down in New York and New England. Looks like the heavier snow up there in New Hampshire and Vermont. And of course, we do want to take a look up north. We are seeing a change in the air masses up in that region. And it's off the top of the chart, but there is a 1050 millibar high north of Alaska, and the extent of that comes all the way down to Yukon, northern British Columbia, the northern prairies, and into the Hudson Bay region. And we can see a vast amount of minus 30s and minus 40s even. The minus 40s probably limited to the Brooks Range right there, and I, I don't think I see any others. But the minus 30s are pretty extensive. Pretty much covers this entire region of the Canadian High Arctic, back towards... Banks Island, and then it looks like some of it comes into the Fort Yukon area of Alaska. Now, this is part of the Arctic air that's going to be developing over the next week and eventually move into the U.S. The 300 millibar hemispheric chart shows the consolidation of a polar vortex over northern Canada. So this entire area here is under the influence of that polar vortex. The other one that we had over Russia has split and headed south over Primorsky Cray, and that's pretty much out of the picture for a short while. And in between, we see this blocking pattern here. That's going to be a large omega block. And if we run the chart forward, we do see that that omega block does get broken down. It almost seems like this trough out over the Aleutians gets blocked, but it does barrow under that block and breaks it up. And briefly, we have this Rex block pattern with a cutoff high in the Arctic Ocean Basin. And then very quickly, by the 4th and 5th, the prevailing westerlies gets established over the Pacific Ocean. Going forward into the weekend, 
You can see that northwesterly flow setting up in the northern U.S. That'll drive some cold air southward. And you can see that the polar vortex does look a little bit stronger. It's still centered over northern Canada. Now the media is probably going to talk about a polar vortex over the Great Lakes area, over the northern U.S. That's not really what's happening. It's remaining up there in northern Canada, but we do have these strongly depressed heights up there in the northern U.S. And that's going to be a reflection of the very cold air in the low levels. Then let's move forward and see how the pattern evolves. We find a cutoff high developing over Greenland and it splits up the polar vortex, one over Ontario and the other in northern Alaska. And even that one is butting right up against this other cutoff high in the Arctic Ocean Basin. And then from there, just kind of a breakup of the vortex pattern, and it looks like the prevailing westerlies gets established once again. However, late in the period, this large overall area of lower heights does indicate that the polar vortex is trying to get reestablished once again, and we're probably going to see more episodes of cold air driving into the northern U.S. later in the month. A lot of it really depends on what happens upstream, especially with respect to this ridge and this cutoff high. We don't really know at this point how that's going to evolve later in the month. But a couple of important indicators, what looks like a very expansive polar vortex, and the fact it's centered on northern Canada in close proximity to the U.S. itself. Also, it looks like we have kind of a low AO index pattern. In other words, the strength of the vortex is not really that high. The jet stream's peaking at maybe 120, 140 knots, and a lot of weaknesses all the way around. And that could be conducive to expansion of the cold air southward. But a lot of that really comes down to the very small scale details. The individual short waves, major short waves, and frontal systems moving through the flow. And this far out, the small scale details are not going to be very accurate. We don't really have a picture on that past about the 8th or 9th of February. Well, let's take a look around the U.S. and see what's happening. That frontal system there in Oregon and Northern California, not very well developed. We see an embryonic Baroclinic leaf across that region. We also see a deep trough off the coast there, but none of it's really come together just yet. So we've just got this fast flow across California, Nevada, and what looks like highly sheared seriform and mid level clouds through that region. And you can see some gravity waves even on this water vapor imagery. There's a better look at that across the northwestern U.S. Looks like some very prominent Lee Cirrus, some mountain wave activity there in the Gillette Sheridan area of Wyoming, all the way up to Billings and into southeastern Montana. In the southern U.S., we have this anticyclonic pattern, what looks like a ridge right in here, and lots of clouds south of that pattern. That indicates to me that maybe we've got a subtropical jet sneaking north. Let's take a look at the charts and see if that's the case. The 500 millibar chart in the middle troposphere shows the strongest bear clinicity across the Pacific Northwest and across the eastern U.S. Not much going on within that ridge down to the south, so that's probably indicating that that could be a subtropical jet. At 300 millibars, at about 30,000 feet, we see a weak outline of a jet. And then going up to 200 millibars, it really fills in. So that's going to be a classic subtropical jet there. You can see the winds are weaker all the way down south in New Mexico. And if we bring up a forecast sounding in northwestern Arizona, this shows the concentration of strong winds above 200 millibars. So, yeah, that's going to be a subtropical jet to the south and a polar front jet up to the north and of course you can see that shows up better at 300 millibars 
elsewhere around North America, some very warm temperatures in Puerto Rico and Dominica. We're seeing 86 at the hour, 88, and that's pretty close to the record high for the date in the San Juan area. And we can see that that's tied to very warm conditions at 925 millibars. Same thing at 850 millibars, and I don't know if you can see it, but there's a call pattern outlined, COL. That's where the flow kind of diverges and converges kind of in this pattern right here. So you see that going on right there. This area here, we're looking at 850 millibars. This is the low, low levels. This is divergent. So likely there's going to be some compensating sinking motion from the upper levels. And that subsidence produces adiabatic warming. And it's probably helping to produce some of the higher temperatures in this region here. Also, divergent right there. And then up to the north and south, we see a convergent flow. And then in the very center, this is indeterminate. And there's how Puerto Rico looks this afternoon. Fair conditions and southeasterly flow, and that puts San Juan on the lee side of that southeasterly flow. The gap winds in southern Mexico are in full effect. We've had that succession of cold air masses moving south. And check out that gap area. You can see that acceleration of the cloud field. It's really impressive. Let me give you the topography once again. So here it is. We can see the Yucatan and the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. And the gap winds affecting this area right here. Unfortunately, observations through that area are hard to come by. But looking at the synoptic plots, looks like a lot of sustained 20 to 25 knots. The winds, and especially the gusts, are definitely going to be higher in the passes. Over the next day or two, we're going to see this high-pressure area recede and move to the east, and we'll see conditions kind of moderating a little bit in the eastern U.S. In the central U.S., the lee side trough will strengthen a bit, and we're going to get strong downslope conditions in Texas. This is what the NAM has for temperatures tomorrow. Coming up to near 80 to 81, just west of Turkey, and 84 there at Pecos. And you can see the weather service going quite warm for those temperatures in western Texas. Now, one way to look at the changes is pressure and temperature. Temperature here is indicated by the shading. And you can see that areas below zero Fahrenheit are shown by the dark purple transitioning into kind of a pale green color. So that's going to be all of this right here. That's going to mark the zero line. And we're going to see that come south. The 32 line indicated by the transition from green to blue. So you can use that as your reference for 32 Fahrenheit. So running that forward, we can see conditions warming up quite a bit tomorrow in West Texas, the appearance of those 80s down there with the strong downslope conditions. Meanwhile, up north, the cold air comes south into the Dakotas and Montana and advances very quickly towards Iowa, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. And by Friday, winds raging out of the northwest, bringing that cold air in, and you can see those zeros coming all the way down towards Rockford, the area just north of Des Moines, and Duluth. And as we go into Saturday and Sunday, some of that starts advancing southward. So there's Saturday night, and you can see we start seeing these grays up to the north, and those are temperatures below minus 30. As we get towards Sunday and Monday, it is definitely in the deep freeze in the Great Lakes. Those are temperatures around minus 10 to minus 20 Fahrenheit without wind chill. Remember, I don't use wind chill here. So you know that that's certainly some very cold air. 
Now, as we get into Monday and Tuesday, we can see that the main thrust of the cold air is down across the Midwest and then recurving up to Quebec. There's just not much southward advance into New York and Washington, D.C., but it'll be, definitely be a cold one up there, and I imagine we'll see some records broken up in that region. Then moving forward, you can see it does not really shut down. And I suspect that due to the sheer density of this whole volume, this could actually ooze southward a little faster than is being forecast. So it could be a very cold one around the second week of February. We also see that there's not much impact into the Rocky Mountains and California. So they're going to get a bit of a reprieve. I know that their agriculture industry does not need a whole bunch of cold air. And the fact that it is kind of mild in Idaho, in Oregon, that's a good indication that this air mass is kind of shallow and mostly heading towards the southeast. But man, through the entire period, yeah, look at that more being generated late in the period. This is going to be quite interesting. We'll have to see how it all evolves. Okay, hope you all enjoyed it. That'll be it for today. I do want to thank our new Patreon supporters, Thomas Haber and Daniel Yoger. Your support is very much appreciated. Hope you all have a great Tuesday. Take care and we will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.